and uh, we're going to start something new next Sunday, which I'm going to go ahead and throw out some props next Sunday. Pastor Jason will be ministering the Word, and so I'm wrapping up today, and then I've got some other things that are starting, another series that's going to start after that. So uh, I just, uh, I, but I believe the Lord has given me some direction on where we're going and some things that are coming up, and uh, I just know it's all going to be good. Amen. I appreciate uh, the weeks that, you know, sometimes I'm gone, I might be out of town, and, and most of the time Pastor Jason jumps in, but I also like to be here occasionally when I can, and, and uh, as he's ministering, so he can minister to me as well. And uh, everybody needs to be ministered to, don't they? You know, if you're, if you're all the time giving, you don't, you know, it's hard sometimes to, to, to get what you need. So you need to have sustenance given to you spiritually the same way as that, uh, you know, anybody else does. And so um, I'll, I'll look forward to that, and then I'll look forward to getting started on a new series. But until then, we're going to give you uh, one last good word on this. And uh, we could, this is a subject you could go on for a long time. You know, in fact, about now that I think about it, there's every subject. I, I could just get one subject and go for a long time. I did one time. You know, I got on one, and I, th- I know, you know, Pastor Jason was like, when is it going to end? Um, but it's all good, and it's all relevant, and it's all stuff that we need to hear that we need to be encouraged with. Amen? So we're going to go ahead and encourage you this morning. Open your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to get started right there, but as we turn there, let me, let me ask you this. When you were maybe, you know, young and being raised in, in your home, and uh, you were still at your house with mom and dad, let me ask you, did you get to do everything you wanted to do? on when you had to come in when you got you remember getting your your first car and you thought you was the coolest thing in the world you got to drive around and you know you wanted to see all your friends and 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 you wanted to go out and you wanted to stay out late and you know you got some kind of curfew and you were told a certain a time that you had to be in you all remember that can you some of you so old you can't hardly remember back that time don't 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 latch on to that. Say you must be talking about somebody else than me, you know. But you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, you were given certain standards of which that you were expected to 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 comply with. You know, you got you know like you got to be in eight o'clock, nine o'clock, ten o'clock, whatever it was. How many of you just got to come in? Go, you take off any time you want. You come out or go out, and then you come in at like one thirty in the morning, and nobody had a problem with that. Is that anybody in the room? So you, it would have been a problem for you going out and coming back in like at 1.30. There's, there is one hand. Who is that? Jim Anderson. Jim, you're messing up my sermon. Well, for most people, most people have certain standards. You know, when it was with our kids, you know, when, when, when they, you know, were starting to get out and go out with their friends, things like that, we didn't just say, hey, whenever. It's not a problem. We don't really care. Just stay, in fact, about it, stay out all night. We don't care. Just come back and, you know, whenever you want, slide in, grab your shower, get you something to eat, and then take off again. We didn't do that. You know, we had certain time limits. We said you got to be in by this time, and if you had, if you're not, if you're running late, you got to call us. I mean, there was all kinds of different things that we had. We had standards, right? You probably had standards of some sort, unless you're in the Anderson family. <laughs> well, what makes us think that in the family of God that there isn't some kind of standards? We've gotten into the world, into, into the, a, an era of time now to where it's, you know, we, we, we want to preach grace, grace, grace for everything. And don't get me wrong, man, I'm like a grace, I'm like one of the biggest grace fans. And I believe in the grace of God like nobody's business. I know that God's grace is like amazing, right? Just like the song. He has amazing grace. I mean, he covers us and gives us chance after chance, and he's always there to help us. 
but that does not change the fact that there is a standard God has a standard of which he wants us to comply with and, and there's a reason why did you not want your kids out all hours of the night why did you why did you create standards for your kids why did you make them comply with certain things why when they were little why did you make them eat their broccoli or whatever or did you just give them Reese cup blizzards and you know and and uh you know whatever they wanted candy bars and ice cream anytime they want now when you're a grandparent it's different <laughs> because your house becomes a land of yes yes of course you want ice cream for breakfast of course bell was over at the house for you it's been a couple of weeks ago and it was it was time to go to bed you know and so we're getting getting out of the living room getting ready to go in the kitchen tidying things up to get ready to go to bed and bell goes nana i'm hungry and she said no bell it's too late it's too late to eat and she goes nana can i have some ice cream she said no bell i said of course you can <laughs> and she looks at me debbie looks at me and says what I said, of course she can. She's a papa and nana's. Of course she can have ice cream before she goes to bed. <laughs> but it is different when you are the, the parent, right? There's standards that you create within your family because why? Why do you, why do you create standards? It's because you know what is best. You know, like if your kid always eats uh, M&M's and ice cream and, and Reese's Cup blizzards uh, all the time. That's all they ever, you know what that's going to do, right? You know it will not be healthy. It's not going to be good for them. You know there's an issue with their health. Why do you tell your kids, you, no, you, you can't, that, but dad, I want to stay out till one o'clock. My buddies and my friends, I don't care about your buddies and your friends. You get your butt home at 10 o'clock you, and you pass 10 o'clock, I'm going to take your dang car, Right? Why do you do stuff like that? It's because you know the world's a dangerous place. You know what is best for your kids. You, you want the safety. It's the utmost uh, concern for you, for you and for your kids is that you want their well-being because you have their well-being at hand and in mind. And when you start just letting anything go, now you know where I'm going, right? You see the parallel that I'm talking about. When you feel that way about your kids, the Bible says, how much more does your heavenly father know how to give good gifts to those that, that love him and that he loves? How much more does he, does he do that for us? But does God have standards? Does he have compliance rules, so to speak? Now, we've, we've gotten again into this place to where we just like grace. I can do anything. Don't tell me what I can do. How dare you say I can't do this? What do you mean I have to abide by that? Because we don't like rules. And see, when we start re reverting back to that, it tells me this. It tells me that we are thinking in the mind of a, wh wh when we were young like that, what was the problem? We always thought mean mom and dad, right? But the, here's the thing, they just have some maturity about them because they know what's good and what's not. And you as a child, you're going, I don't understand why you want to do this, why I can't have no fun, because you're thinking in the mind of someone that is not mature. And then when you start thinking that there's grace, 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 grace for everything, I can just do anything, there's no compliance rules, what we're, do, what we're really exhibiting is the fact that we are in a mindset of immaturity, spiritually speaking. And see, God has certain things intact for a reason because he knows what's best for me and you. And that's the reason that he sets certain things in place is not because he just doesn't want you to have fun in life. In fact, about it, I can honestly say walking with God and serving God is like super cool. It, it doesn't have to be a drag. We've made it to be a drag in some senses, but it doesn't have to be, but that doesn't change the fact that he still has certain things in mind for us because he wants our well-being, and he knows what is best. Now watch this. Matthew chapter 21. Let me start reading with verse 28. He says, What do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first, and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. Then he came to the second, 
and said likewise and he answered I will go sir but did not go which of the two did the will of his father which of the two did the will of his father obviously we know the answer is the first one he didn't like it he didn't really even want to go you be home at 10 o'clock boy I ain't going to do it you will I ain't going to do it but he does and the other you say you be at home 10 o'clock yes sir I will daddy I'll be right here but he doesn't which one do you think daddy was the most pleased with see talk is cheap it's about what you do in the kingdom of God and God here is showing us that he has certain things in mind for us and he gives us certain directives and he gave these two sons certain directives go work in the vineyard one said he wouldn't go but he did after he repented the other one said he would go but he didn't which one pleased God the one the one that went right so I started thinking about this and I is I want to talk about what it means and what it looks like to be a good son because in order to be a good son you have to have the representation of a good father see that's the way that children get molded that's and it's the same way in the kingdom of God it's the way that good children of God get molded is when they're connected to a good father and see when we see that God is good it has an impression upon us I'm, I get so frustrated when I hear some of the messages and through the years and we, I think we've largely gotten better but we got into some of these messages to where it was like trying to scare people we were trying to you know almost force them into the kingdom of God like if you don't do it you, go, you die tonight you're going to hell which might be true but that is not what wins people to the kingdom of God trying to scare people is not what wins what, what, what wins people is when they see that God is a good God. He's a good father. And when we see that he's a good father, it draws. There's an attraction to that. The same way that when a father is a good father, naturally speaking, there's an attraction to that that makes good, good sons. We're going to use sons today because it's, it's, it's Father's Day. And, and, well, you could say even and good daughters as well. So, but the sons had a choice here. They didn't need, I can, I'm fairly assured that neither one of them wanted to go work in the vineyard. Right? Yeah, I mean, did you all wake up when you was young and when, when you were told to go to work? Were you just totally excited about it? You get up, you know, and say, today you get up and go to work. Most kids aren't that crazy about getting up and going to work. So I'm relatively assured that neither one of them were that crazy about doing it, but it required something in order for them to do it, and it was called submission. They had to submit. They had to submit or not submit to the will of their father. And submission is such a dirty word. It, I mean, to us. Because it means, what do, you, what do you mean submit? It, that goes against the fact that I get to do whatever I want to do. Because submission, what, what does submission means, mean? It, it means that you might not agree it might be harder than you thought or you expected something would be or you don't understand why and we talked a little bit about that last week you don't understand why you don't have all the answers but yet you still do it you submit because you understand there is someone that is higher than you and when it comes to children with their parents right they they understand or they should understand their parents are higher than them on the authority chain well, what about in our relationships with, with God? Is God above me and you? And when we know that the Spirit of God, whether it be by the Word of God or by the Spirit, is giving us certain directives, do we submit and yield to His will? Do you know that Jesus had to do exactly the same thing? Do you know Jesus had to submit? Now, submission means you don't necessarily agree you, you could, or but you recognize it's hard, harder than you want, or you don't understand why, but yet you still do it. Do you know Jesus had to do that? 
Luke chapter 22, verse 42. He says, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, watch now, but your will be done. He says, if you're willing, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. So what does that tell you about Jesus? Because you have to realize Jesus is a man just like me and, you know, uh, like we are. We're human. He submitted himself to humanity so that he could become like me and you because that was the only way to win back the relationship with God. So he has to submit just like me and you. And his body, everything within his body was telling him. He knew what he was about ready to experience. And everything that he knew that he was about ready to experience was not a pleasant thought. He knew what he was about ready to go through. And he said, essentially, if there's another way, Lord, Father, if we could do it another way, I would appreciate it if we could do it that way. But, but, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. In other words, I would rather do it differently if it's possible, but I submit to your will no matter what. I submit, I yield to you because I know what you know best. You know what needs to be done better than I do. And so when I don't understand, when it's harder than I think that I'd really rather do, or I just don't agree. I was thinking about, and I think I might have used that example last week when I was in church many years ago in a different church. I did not understand why we were going from a, a, a church building that was a sanctuary church to go have church in the gym. I didn't understand that. And so quietly I was kind of, you know, just to myself for the most part, I was kind of being critical. Y'all, I'm sure you all never do that. I'm sure that you guys don't look, you don't get critical. And and I just don't know if I like that sermon or not. I just don't think I agreed with that sermon. I think he was off base. I'm sure you never do that. However, at that moment, I was sitting there being a little critical, like, I don't understand. Why are we having church in a, in a gym? Uh, the gym was made so we could play basketball. Why in the world are we doing this? It's ridiculous. I don't understand. And the Spirit of God spoke to me just as clear as I could ever remember. There's been a handful of times that I knew that I knew that I knew God was speaking directly to me and in, in, in some instance chastising me. And the Spirit of God said, uh, what is that to you? You don't have to understand. He said, you're not the pastor. Even if he's wrong, it's not your call. He said, your your choice is, will you submit? Because I didn't agree at the time. I didn't think it was, I'm like, why? I don't agree with this. We got a church building. Why do we need to be in there? Why? And he said, your choice is you either submit and yield or you and, and, and even though you're in disagreement you're, you're going to be in disagreement no matter what you either disagree and submit or you disagree and don't submit but now you're opposing me the Lord says because that's between me and him he's like you have to learn that you don't get everything. You don't get to do it. You, you know that we as Christians, we don't make our own marching orders. We, we don't get to, to say, oh, you know what, I think I'll do this. So many people, they, they, you know, they, they leave things just because they get, you know, well, I just, I don't like the way they're doing that. I don't like the way they're doing this. I'm tired of this one. I'm tired of that one. I'm tired of my husband. I'm tired of my wife. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of that. And we, we tend, or I'm tired of that church tired of the way that they never you know they don't they don't sing the songs that I like I you know I put in my request you know and they don't sing my song I requested this song a long time ago it's like you know being at uh you know a bar when you put in your crest your request you know hey can you all sing this song y'all ever been there before come on now don't don't look at me like you all no don't know what I'm talking about you know, sometimes we're down in Hilton Head. We'd be out having dinner or something. There's this guy out there playing the guitar or whatever, and he'd take 
back in some of the day, back in the eight, back in the seventies, eighty music when it was really music. Don't get me started on that. But y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And so I go out there and I say, hey, you know what? You remember this song? Yeah, yeah. I know that. Can I put in a request? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. I'll do that one. Well, we feel like sometimes, well, they didn't sing my song that I wanted. So I'm going to leave church. I'm going to go to another church. After all, somebody that will appreciate my kind. We've had people come in church down in, when we was in downtown that wanted to sing. They come in. They say, well, I can, I can really sing. And, uh, you know, I want to do this. And we're like, well, okay. But, you know, but there's a standard. We go through a standard. Now, I know the church people don't, sometimes don't like to hear that. I, everybody can, you know, you ever been to, I'm not going to name denominational names, but you go to certain churches and they'll say, oh, Pastor so-and-so, I've got a song I'd like to sing. And they can't sing. I mean, they sound like they're strangling a cat. <laughs> but they want to sing it. My, and I'm not against them singing it in the shower, in their shower, in their home. But it doesn't bring edification to the church, and it's disruptive. And then it comes in, you've got 15 people jumping up to sing a song, and it doesn't do anything. Now, I'm going somewhere, so be patient with me. And they don't like to be told no. You won't let me sing my song? You won't let me do it this way? You won't let me do it that way? Well, I'll just take my talent. Well, that's your first problem. You're thinking about it as a talent rather than an anointing and a call. I'm going to take my talent and go somewhere else, and I'll sign up, and the next church will really appreciate what I can do. I say go. Go because you're not willing to submit. And until you learn to submit to the things of God, you'll have a hard time to submit to what God really wants for your personal life. If you can't submit to a certain you know, standard of things the way that, that are structured, I, 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 I just told you, I have not always agreed with things. And even you know, today, going to certain other places, I might disagree. But it's not my call. So I have to submit and say, I just submit. I submit and say, even though I might disagree, even though... I might not understand, or even though it might be harder than I really want to do, I have to make the decision, if it's God, then I need to submit. And we just don't like those words. We just don't like to do that because it means going against what we want. And after all, we live in this society today where it's like, I should have what I want. I should be able to change. Anytime I want to change, I should be able to do this anytime I want to do it. And I don't have to consult with God on anything. Do you know, the Lord wants us to consult with him on just about everything. Now, I'm not talking about buying Charmin or, or Angel Soft. Because sometimes people get a little weird even in that. And they go, you know, I need to go over here and meditate and pray in tongues over the toilet paper to make sure I get which one it is. That's not what I'm talking about, folks. Amen. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about we need to hear from God as to what he wants us to do, even when we're in disagreement with it. I'm telling you, there's been lots of times I've been in disagreement on many things. You know, there was uh, years ago, you've heard the story. I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just go ahead and share it again real quick. We were, we were at New Life, and, and, you know, we were there serving Pastor Huffman, and and anybody that knows Pastor Huffman, you know what I'm talking about. He's 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 kind of like a, just a little, you know, uh, t- he's a tough guy. You know what I'm talking about, Bob? <laughs> I love him, and he knows that. And and and, and he, he, you know, and I don't say anything negative. It's not anything like that. But he's just tough. And so I'm in the back. They'd asked me back there, and it was already tough enough as it was because they go back there, and you're, you're an attendant to Pastor Huff, and you're on the back and kind of help get everything ready and, you know, get them out, to, you know, to, situated, and if they need anything before the service starts. And they always wanted us to... Uh, to uh, take uh, Pastor Huffman's Bible and Miss Bonnie's purse out just a few minutes before they came out. Now, I don't know about you. It's kind of like this for me. We, we, me and Debbie be on vacation sometimes, and uh, she always wants one of the spa days. You know what I'm talking about? 
you're on, you're on vacation for five, six days in the Caribbean or something like that. And she's like, we're doing a spa day. You know what that means? We're getting a massage. So one of my first things is, and she knows this, I go in, I'm just, I, I, you call me what you want if you want now. I don't care. Okay? But I go in and I'm like, uh, I, it's just I'm weird about this, but I'm like, uh, I'm a man. And I don't want no man rubbing on me. I, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Now, I, it, I just, that's the way it is. I'm like, it ain't right. <laughs> so I'm like, you got a female back there, right, that can sign me up with her. I'm just saying, I'm just being honest. Debbie signs me up with, make sure that, you know, I get the ladies, you know, that they, they're rubbing. Anyway, so it's kind of like, you, you know, so you know what I mean? You get that manly kind of feel about you, and, and then you get told, you carry out Miss Bonnie's purse. I'm like, excuse me? What? And it's like, you know, so you go in the back, and here you go. I mean, because you're going through the whole church. Excuse me just a minute. So you come out of the office, you know, and here you are walking in front of everybody. I tried every way in the world to disguise it best I could. I was like... Coming down like this, you know, because you, I mean, yeah, how many people wants to carry it like, like this? I mean, you want to carry, you want to carry Miss Bonnie's purse like that? Ain't many people want to do that if you're a man. You know what I'm talking about? But you have a choice. I'm not in charge. I'm in a position, and I've been told. I didn't, they didn't ask my opinion. You know, Phil, would you, how do you feel about taking Miss Bonnie's purse out? Would that be all right? They didn't ask my opinion. They said, grab Pastor Huffman's Bible and grab Miss Bonnie's purse and take it out and put it on uh, where they sit. They didn't ask my opinion. I've been given a directive. Now I have a choice. Do I submit to the will of my superior or do I get all bent out of shape and say, I ain't going to do that. I don't, I don't do that kind of stuff. What are you talking about? Or another time, you know, we're in the back and we're getting ready for church on a Wednesday night. And Pastor Huffman, you just have to know Pastor Huffman. I don't, they, the words don't even, I don't even have to explain it if you know Pastor Huffman. We're getting ready to walk out the back and Pastor Huffman goes, Ready? And there's three or four guys there, you know. We're ready. And we're going to walk out with him. He goes, all right, let's go. And he starts walking. He goes, hey, by the way, can I talk to you just for a few minutes after service? Uh, you sure, sure. All right, good. And he goes on. I'm like, what was that about? What, what does that, what, what do you mean you want to talk to me? I, have I messed, I've messed up. He's going to correct me. I'm getting ready to get corrected. What did I do? The whole time, the whole message, I never heard one thing he said. I'm sitting there in my seat, and I'm sitting here going, what in the world have I done? I've met. Did I go in too early? Did I get Miss Bonnie's purse too early? Did I, did I interrupt him? Did I forget to knock? I can't remember. Did I knock on the door? Did I just walk in? I'm about ready to get I, uh, and then I'm And then, you know, I just start to work myself up. Now, that ain't right. That is just not right. If I'm going to get corrected, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm just sitting there just, work, just getting myself in a big fluster. I ain't going to put, I ain't going to, now I can't do that. If I get corrected, I can't do that because I didn't do anything wrong. And the Spirit of God begins to talk to me and says, it doesn't matter if you did anything wrong or not. In your mind, in your eyes, if you get corrected, what are you going to do? Are you going to rebel? Or are you going to submit? And then the Holy Spirit said, what if he just wanted to bless you? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> what if he was going to ask you to preach for him? I was like, I don't think so. At the end of the service, he goes, come on back here, Phil. Go in the back, and he goes, hey, listen, I'm going to be out of, uh, out of town on Wednesday. I might make it back, but I might not, and I just figured it'd be nice if I just didn't have to preach on Wednesday night. Would you, would you be prepared to preach for me on Wednesday? 
I'm like, oh, all of that for nothing. But see, what was happening was the Holy Spirit was teaching me a lesson right then and right there as to what are you going to do? You're going to learn to submit to the will of God. And if you can't submit to your superior here, then what makes you think you'll submit to him when you don't understand or you don't know why? It's like I learned some things that day about what I need to, how I need to look and how I need to, to respond. He five, verse four says, and no, and no man takes this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, you are my son today, have I begotten you? Talking about Jesus. As he saith also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. Who's he talking about here? He's talking about when Jesus was submitting, hey, if there's another way, he feels the weight of the world upon his shoulders. This is significant because you don't you can't diminish the fact and forget the fact that Jesus yes is the son of God but he has stripped himself of all of that so that he becomes a man and he's experiencing everything that me and you would experience and if you knew that you were about ready to be crucified if you knew in the next hour you would hang on a cross and you would be shamefully treated and painfully you know your body would experience pain and suffering like nobody can imagine if you knew that was coming would you be excited about it and say praise God hallelujah I get to be crucified or would you be sitting there the mental anguish of that knowing what's about ready to take place Jesus was no different he's feeling the magnitude of all this and we offered up prayers and supplications and strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared Though he were a son, watch, yet learned the obedience, learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus learned obedience by the fact that he was suffering from the fact of knowing that he had to submit to the will of the Father. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that watch, obey him. So there's something about obedience that God is like really into. God is really into obedience. He wants obedience. Now watch this. In Genesis chapter 16, I was reading this, and I kind of laugh every time I look at this, but it's still, it'll, it'll, it'll get you to the place where I want you to, to see. Genesis chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had a maidservant, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Please go into my maid. It may be that I will obtain children through her. Abraham listened to Sarah. I mean, watch out. Is Abraham just like doing what he was told to do? Come on now. He listened to Sarah. Okay, maybe whatever you say. So after Abram had been living for 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, his wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. He went into Hagar, I might add, just like Sarah said, right? And she conceived. When she saw that she had conceived, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abraham, May the wrong done to me be on you. I'm like, say what, Jack? What do you mean the wrong that was done to you be on me? Me? You, you, you told me to do something, I did it, right? Boy, I'm not getting much help here. Now, this, that's not where I want to be, though. That was all, it was all for fun. I gave my maid into your arms... And when she saw that she had conceived, 
I became despised in her eyes. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarah, Indeed, your maid is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarah dealt harshly. Everybody say harshly. Harshly with her, and she fled from her presence. The angel of the Lord found her. Now, notice the angel of the Lord. Okay, this is a spiritual encounter. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. It was the spring on the way to Shur, and he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress, now watch, and submit yourself unto her authority. That sounds hard. Go back to the one that's like, She's upset. And, and maybe in her mind, rightfully so, because that attitude changed. A lot of things changes when, you, you know, when that kind of thing happens. But he says, you go back and you submit to the one that has treated you harshly. Now that sounds like something hard, and sometimes submission is hard. It's hard on your flesh, because many times your flesh is opposed to the will of God. The will of God is speaking to you about certain things, and your flesh is generally, generally speaking, opposed to the things of God. It generally, if you had to, if you had to say, does my flesh line up more with the, the way of the world or the way of the devil's thinking or the way of God's, usually your flesh is more in line with what the devil wants. Usually. I'm not going to say that all the time, but usually. That's why the Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season, because your flesh likes it likes sin. Let's just be honest. Your flesh didn't get saved when you got saved. Your spirit man got saved, but your flesh still likes to do a lot of stuff. And he says, go back and submit to the one that's been treating you harshly. Sounds like submission to me is hard. And it is. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm just going to call a spade a spade. It is hard. It isn't easy because you want what you want and then the Spirit of God comes in or the Word of God comes in and tells you something different and it's hard for you to submit to that because submission means that you're yielding. You're saying, I will yield to your way of thinking instead of mine. You remember in 1 Samuel when when Saul was granted kingship and God had told him he's going to establish the kingdom through Saul's lineage and The first chance that Saul gets, what does he do? The Lord told him, he said, I want you to go out and I want you to utterly destroy Amalekite and Agag and I want you to destroy them all. Even their, I mean, even the livestock, everything. And so Saul, he's like, well, wait, wait, maybe we keep Agag. You never know. It might be good to have a prisoner here. We we could probably leverage ourselves with him. He's beginning to think instead of obey. He keeps the best, the best of the livestock, and then Samuel calls him out for it. And he says, what are you doing? Why didn't you obey? He said, what do you mean I obeyed? I obeyed. He says, well, wh- what? I hear the livestock. What are you talking about? He said, oh, well, we just kept back some of the livestock for sacrifice so we could sacrifice. Because after all, God likes sacrifice. And you remember what Samuel told Saul? He said, it's better to obey than to sacrifice and listen to God and to not refuse and rebel. He said, it's better just to obey, simply obey than to sacrifice something. I've used this example so many times in the past. I've worn out, but it stays with me in, in my memory that early on in the early part of our, our saved life, I was going to a Pastor Rod Parsley meeting and I was on a church van and I was sitting in the back. I'd heard about Rod. I'd seen some of his messages and he's a, he's a cool dude, you know, and, and had a good message and the church was going and they had somebody driving the church van and I'm in the back just, you know, going, Debbie's at home. She was still kind of in her, in her denominational ways. I was trying to pull her out and get her into the Word of Faith and, and some Pentecostal stuff, but she still was like a little reserved. So she's like, you, you can go. I don't want to go down there. 
and so I'm back in the back by myself I had 120 I believe it was 122 dollars in the checkbook I knew I mean I knew what was in the checkbook 122 dollars in spirit of God began to talk to me and he said I want you to give a hundred dollars I had never given a hundred dollars in my life at one time and God said I want you to give a hundred dollars I'm like no sir mm -mm. no but what I can do is this Lord I'm normally a twenty dollar man I can go to fifty would that work and God said, oh, you could give 50. You could give 75. You could give 99. But you'd still be in disobedience. It'd be close. It'd be better in the sense of better than 20 if you're, if you're thinking about amounts. And that's not really how God looks at it. He said, if you're thinking about amounts, then it would be better. But you'd still be in disobedience. That'll jerk the slack out of you when you're sitting in the back, quiet in the back of the van, and everybody else is up there talking and just, and you're in the back, and all you can hear is God. I'm like, I'd rather be talking with him, God. He said, so what are you going to do? And I finally said, I'm going to write a check for $100. That's going to leave me $22. Hope I didn't make a mistake in the checkbook. I said, but I'm going to write a $100 check. And you know what? I don't, and I can't say that that moment that I could pin it just exactly to that moment. But I can tell you this. From that day forward, you're looking at one of the most blessed men that you could possibly look at. And I don't mean just money. That too. Don't apologize for being blessed. Good Lord. Why would we, why we want people to, to be, you know, to have nothing? Why, why do we want that? We shouldn't want that. We want, I want everybody blessed. I get excited when I hear about people getting blessed financially. It excites me because it's like, man, there's the blessing of God on you. I'm excited for people that, that I mean, I'm so excited for Pastor Jason getting that new truck, man. It's, I'm just like, I'm, I'm like in his corner, like, you know, doing the rah-rah. Get it. Go. Be blessed. No, it might, man, it don't have to be a car because some people don't care that much about it. It can be all kinds of things. But see, God opened up doorways because of not just sowing, it was that too, but watch. Because I obeyed. I obeyed. And when you obey, when you obey, there's a, there's a reward attached to obedience. Watch. If Saul had obeyed God and did exactly what God told him to do, would the kingdom have been stripped from him? Would the kingdom have had a need for David to come up and become king? He wouldn't have because Saul would have been someone that God could trust because that's what it comes down to. Obedience comes down to trust. Can God trust you to do what he tells you to do when you don't understand, when you might even disagree, and when it even looks harder than what you thought it would be, but you still obey anyway? Isaiah 119 says, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. I'm telling you, I'm convinced that so many Christians today miss it, not just because of the laws of sowing and reaping. There is that. But I'm convinced that many people miss it because they just don't obey God. And they know better. They hear the voice of God. They see the word of God. And they always work together. But they hear God saying certain things. And I've told you before, there's times before that, that God has dealt with me about doing certain things that I just did not want to do. I, Debbie can tell you, I had won these, these uh, I had won a, uh, a, a, a new set of, of it, was it, ping? it wasn't the pings. No, it was the, uh, I had the ping golf clubs, you know, just loved, I used to play a lot more golf than I play now, but I, I had these uh, ping irons and I won some just, you know, where they pull your name out. I played in a, in a like a scramble and afterwards they, they you know, they just pulled names out of a little TV and, and I won uh, Callaway, those Callaway graphite shaft irons. 
I, man, I, I, I looked at him. I was like, this is amazing. These are great. This is great. And so I went out and played with them one time. And I was like, oh, my gosh. They may, I may need to apply for the, for the tour. I'm like hitting them. But see, God knew something. Watch this. This is even cool. This is even a cool thing. God knew that the graphite shafts weren't right for me because I had another set later on and I was swinging so hard. I swing hard when I, when I play golf. I'm not one of these guys that just goes up there. I mean, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm going to kill this thing. Get up there. Boom. And so I was playing with not these graphite shafts, but some more at a different time. I got out there and swung. And when I swung, I saw something going with the ball. The ball was going, but then the head of the club was going right in Ed Allen's pond out at Sugarwood Golf Course. And Ed told me, he said, you swing too hard for graphite shaft irons. You need steel irons. They're steel shafts. But see, so back to the thing. God's saying, he came to me one day, Pastor Jason, he told me, he said, I want you to give those golf clubs away to a young man that worked for you at the time. And I was like, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No. That's not right, God. That is not right. You gave me those irons. There's not, that is not right. I said, I've got a good set of pings, and, and, and those are fine, fine clubs. I'll give those. He said, you could, and that would be a blessing but you'd still be in disobedience. Are you going to submit and do what I told you to do or not? I'm just being honest with you, okay? Because you have to understand the context of what I'm, when I'm telling you this stuff. It took me three days. You wouldn't think it'd be a big, that big a deal. It was like six, $700 set of clubs, you know? But it took me three days of negotiating and finally realizing there's no way out of this. It's either do it and obey or don't do it. I could have given him, if there was nine clubs, I could have given him eight and I'm still in disobedience. It's either do it and obey when you don't understand or don't do it and be in disobedience. I finally said, all right, all right, I'll do it. I will do it. And I walked up and I told him, I said, I want you to understand this boy's name was Ryan. I said, Ryan, I want you to understand something. I don't know if you understand anything about God or relationship with God. I don't even know if you say, I don't know. But I'm going to tell you this right now. These clubs, they're not from me. <laughs> These do not come from me. As far as I'm concerned, I don't want you to have them. They're not, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'd be happy if you'd blessed, but not from my clubs. No, they're not from me. These come directly from God. He said, what? I don't know what you're talking about. I said, you don't really need to know. I said, I don't want you to have them, but God says he wants you to have them, so here they are. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the exact truth. That's exactly what I told him. And I was kind of irritated about it. Now, granted, God had to get my attitude changed, you know, somewhere along the way. He's like, son, you obeyed, but you wasn't willing, and you better get willing, or you ain't going to eat the good of the land. But you at least took the first step to obey. I'm trying to find out here how I can get out of this. Look, let me just read a couple more verses, and I'll let you go. Let me look at James 4. James 4. Then I want to read this to you first. The model for obedience is submission. And submission requires humility. But submission does demonstrate faith. See, when you can, when you can submit when you don't know why, you don't understand, you don't want to. Or it's harder than you want to do, but yet you still do it anyway. It shows that you trust. And in order to do it, 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 will, it will require humility. And this is why I know that. Look at this, James 4, verse 6. He says, but he gives more grace. Wherefore, he says, 
God resists the proud but gives grace to the who? To the humble. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. When you say, no, I, I don't understand that. No, I know better than that. I'm not going to do that. This is ridiculous to have church inside of a, a, a gymnasium. I'm not doing it. I'm just not going to be a part of that. I'm just, I'm going to find me another church. I'm not giving those golf clubs away because that's ridiculous. You just gave them to me. I just got them. Why would I do that? What you're saying is, is you know better than God, and that's a state of pride. But when you, when you can say, I, I don't really know why. I'm actually even in disagreement physically with this thing. I just don't, I don't see it. But I do know your voice. And I do know that right now that's what you're telling me. I know what you're telling me. And even though I don't want to, I don't like it, I don't want to do it, I still am going to do it. People think that you have to like what it is that you're doing with God. He didn't say you have to like it. He just said, if you're willing and obedient. There's been things the Lord has dealt with me about that I didn't like. Not because, because I'm dealing with physical flesh. And my flesh is saying, I don't want, I don't want to do that. There are things for y'all that I have done that I didn't like. Amen. Amen. Youth are saying, I know you're sitting there thinking, I thought, but you love us. I thought you'd do anything. I will do it. Well, not anything, but maybe a lot of things for y'all. But that don't mean I have to like everything. Do you like everything you do? Surely, I mean, maybe you're better than me and you like everything you do, but I doubt it. He says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. So in other words, when he says submit yourselves therefore unto God, he's saying because he gives more grace to the humble. Submit, which means you'll be showing humility. So because of that, submit unto God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So God is trying to show us that we, it, you have to learn to submit. You have to learn to obey. You have to learn to, to listen to what the Spirit of God says, and when you don't feel like doing it, you don't like it, you still do it. And listen, why do I say that? Because, watch now, because I love you. And I know this much. If you'll do that, if you'll be obedient, if you'll submit when you don't understand. People sometimes say, you know, I normally submit. This time I just don't agree. You just told me you don't know what submission is. If you agree, there's no need to submit because you agree. Submission means there is some friction. You don't understand why. You don't, you didn't, it, it looks too hard or you're in disagreement. That's, but you have to understand submission, there's a line of authority. Let me, let me try to get ready to close with this. Turn over to, uh, Turn over to Philippians chapter 2, and, and, and I'll try to close with that. But, but as you're getting over there and I'm getting there, I want to tell you about Matthew chapter 8. I had too many notes. Can't get all of them. You, you all get me going, and I just I can't you know, get it all in. So you remember the story about the Roman centurion who came on behalf of his, of his uh, servant. He came to the Lord, or he sent word to the Lord, and he said, uh, I have a, a servant, a, a soldier, that lies at the point of death. <coughs> Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. Now the centurion, he's a man of war. See, submission is a military term. Because it referenced, I mean, anybody that knows anything, if you've been in the military, you know anything about the military, you understand something about submission. When you signed up for the Army or the Navy or wherever, whatever branch of military you went into, and you go, you know what? I'll tell you where you can put me. You put me in Hawaii. That's where you send me. And they go, well, no, sir, we're sending you to, uh, you know, Alaska. And you go, no, sir, no, no, I'm not going to Alaska. Why? You, I, you find out real quick, you don't get to make the rules, right? You do what? You do what you're told. You obey, and you learn that. 
as you go along. If you don't understand it going in, you will before you come out. You do what you're told. Now, this Roman centurion has a revelation of this because why? He's in the military. And he says to Jesus in verse 9 in the Amplified Bible, he says, For I am also a man subject to authority of a higher rank, with soldiers subject to me, and I say to one, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes, and to my slave, Do this, and he does it. And then he goes on to say, Just speak the word, and I know that my servant will be made whole. How can he say that, and what is he saying when he's saying this? He's saying, I understand I am of lower rank than you. So I submit to you. You tell me what it is. You say what needs to be said, and I will submit to that. I'll yield to that. I understand how this works. I have higher ranks, and I have lower ranks. And right now, I recognize you're higher than me. And folks, God is always higher than us. And when he tells us and he speaks to us and gives us directives, instead of fighting it, I know it's a natural tendency because I've been there with you, right? I just shared, I tell all, I tell on myself, right? I've been there, I know what that's all about. But what do you do? You submit and you obey what he says. Now let me read this to you in, in Philippians chapter two and we'll close right here. Philippians step, chapter 2, verse 6. No, let me, let me start with verse 5. He says, Let this mind be in you, and be in you all, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He emptied himself, taking upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the form of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him. Notice that. He humbled himself. And then what happened? And he became obedient even to death. So if we want to learn how to submit and obey the things of God, we first have to recognize he's higher than us and I have to be humble to recognize that and not be in pride to think that somehow or another I'm God's greatest gift to humanity, that I know everything that needs to be known. I don't always understand everything. I didn't understand years ago when the Lord dealt with me about starting a church. I'll be honest with you, it was the farthest thing from my mind. Now, we enjoyed church, and we enjoyed being in, in, the, in the presence of other believers, and, and we had certain things that, you know, that we were happy to be a part of. But I really didn't necessarily want to do it. There was times that I enjoyed to get to preach. You know, it's like different than pastoring. Preach is different than pastoring. I like to preach. Pastoring is a little harder because you got to deal with you all. Because, you know, there's work involved. And the Lord began to deal with us about starting a church. And he said, I want you to start a church in Ashland. And let me tell you how, how precise God is. He said, I want you to start a church in Ashland. Now, I live in Russell. And so... Me and Debbie talked about it, and I was like, I don't know, God, I think God's really serious about this, and how do you feel about it? And she's like, I sense it too. And finally, we're like, okay, let's, let's do it. Let's begin to look. And so we began to look, and I drove by this place that was in Russell. It was fairly close to my home. And I thought, this could work. This would be a great starting place. It wasn't very big, but, you know, you don't have anybody. I mean, there was nobody there. And I thought, this would work. And so we called, and there was a lady that owned the building, and she gave us the tour, and we looked at it. And I was like, I think this could work. And I went home, and you know what happened for the next three nights? I couldn't sleep, and I woke up like drenched in sweat. Just, it was like, okay, are you telling me you don't want me to start a church? 
And the Spirit of God said, no, it's not that. I don't want you to start a church in Russell. I said, oh, so it's that specific. Ashland, did you? I am a little slow sometimes. I'm, I'm like, you know, I feel like God sometimes has to go like this. Ashland, what part of that did you not get? I thought, well, it's the greater Ashland area. <laughs> Ashland. Like, okay, all right, Lord. I don't know why. I don't understand everything. But do you know that God knew that this building, this there, uh, that this land would be here for us? He knew that. He, I mean, when I didn't know it, and I didn't know where it was coming from, he knew it. He always has a reason, and he always has a plan. Don't diminish that. Don't make it feel like it isn't important. It is. Submit to the will of God. Jesus submitted to the will of God, even when his flesh was screaming, saying, is there another way to do it than this? But being the man and the son of God that he was, he was capable of looking and, and saying, Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And that's what we have to get to the place of saying, Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. At the end of the day, Lord, I'll do what you tell me to do. I'll submit to your way. I'll submit to your will. And that's another sermon to getting to the place to where you clearly hear what the voice of the Lord is telling you. And when you do, submit and obey. Amen. With every head bowed, please, just for one moment.